Top Med Talk. Well, hello and welcome to the show. It's Top Med Talk, and we are at Euroanesthesia 2024. It's the annual congress of the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care, or ESIAC. We're in Munich, Germany, in the exhibit hall, and it has been an absolutely fantastic meeting so far. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host, and I'm joined by my co-host, the lovely, the wonderful Professor Kate Leslie. Thank you for that kind introduction, Desiree. Well, I, it's not, it's actually probably not enough considering the wonderful work that you and Andy Cumsty did uh, at the ANSCA meeting, the annual scientific meeting a couple weeks ago. Thank you so much for heading Top Med Talk Down Under. Oh, it was great fun. And it's great to see uh, everyone having fun at the European meeting. It is. There are quite a lot of similarities with the Australian meeting with everyone buzzing around the HCI exhibition and catching up with friends. But yeah. the difference is here, everywhere you turn, someone's speaking a different language. I, that's right. really good. I'm it testing is. out my knowledge. Yeah, how's that going for you? Not well. Okay. <laughs> I know. Well, Kate, we have had a wonderful opportunity to be here this year at ISIAC with the generous support and partnership with the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. They have been wonderful partners. We have a beautiful booth here in the exhibit hall where we can kind of see everything in front of us. We have wonderful people coming in. And out of sessions, there's a poster session right behind us. We just want to say thank you so much for supporting us to be here this year. Without that partnership, there's no way we can be here at meetings and have these wonderful conversations. So a huge shout out to them. And of course, a shout out to all of our sponsors who make Top Men Talk free and open access to the world. So thank you. Thank you. Our guest this morning, it is a pleasure to introduce our very distinguished guest, Professor Michelle Struess who is with the ESAIC, ISIAC, and um, is here joining us today. Michelle, thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. It's yeah. a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Well, please, for our listeners, why don't you give us a little bit more about your background personally, professionally, and then we'll dive into ISIAC. Yeah, okay. So I'm an anesthesiologist, of course, otherwise I would not be here today. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm also a clinical pharmacologist. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm professor and chair at the Department of Anesthesiology in, uh, in Groningen, University yeah. Medical Center in Groningen, which is in the north of the Netherlands. I am the chair of the scientific committee of ISAIC. Yeah. Well, we want to say... Year, yeah. yeah, we want to say congratulations. Thank you. Wonderful meeting. Well, there is a proud man sitting here. I'm very proud of uh, what the team, because it's a huge team, yes. accomplished here over... Now it's a preparation of one year. We started the program more than one year ago. And it's, of course, challenging scientifically because you have to predict a little bit what will be the next hot topics within 12 to 15, 16 months. So it's always trying to find the most hottest topics to put in the largest rooms and which will attract most people. Yeah. So that's, of course, a lot of the fun. And uh, we do that with a team of, of 80 experts from all over Europe and even in From outside a- Europe, yeah, we have 43 member states here at ISAIC. Diversity and inclusivity is, of course, in our scientific committee a big thing. So we try to have members of the committee being anesthesiologists, intensivists, and, and researchers who are giving us all the input to come up with this, what I find a fantastic program, of course, but I'm biased. <laughs> just, just, a, just a little bit. Yeah. Well, the, the program is wonderful. I mean, the topics... They're very appropriate, and we I can see where you spend a lot of time curating all the speakers. Tell us a little bit about some of the highlights of the meeting this weekend. You have six forums. Yeah. It's perhaps interesting to know. So the scientific committee exists of experts, uh, and they are in six forums. You have patients, therapies, um, ethics, and so on. So all these forum chairs with their members, they come up with proposals. And there is a lot going on on artificial intelligence, of course, uh, in all fields of anesthesia, but also patient safety, changes in the intensive care environment. We have a lot on cardiac and hemodynamics this year. And we had a huge symposium yesterday that filled up not only the first half of Auditorium 1, security had to open the balcony. Yeah, we were quite uh, amazed about that. It was about the symposium with three speakers on the challenges of cardiac compromised patients for non-cardiac surgery, yes. which is, of course, a big thing these days, as you all know, that our population of patients in perioperative medicine and intensive care is changing over the last yeah. decade. And so we have more and more complex patients with low comorbidities. Yeah. 
So these kind of topics that relates to that are, of course, very popular among our clinicians who have to deal with these patients every day in the OR and the intensive care. Absolutely. And pain is coming back. We have some pain symposia also because we want to cover also pain medicine and emergency medicine, which are the four pillars of, of anesthesiology. So we try to yeah. have a little bit from everything from every, for everybody. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's our purpose. Yeah. That is for sure. So as a clinical pharmacologist, Michelle, you might have noticed that there are not many drug companies represented in the healthcare industry re- exhibition. In fact, that's been a trend over a, a 20 or 30 Correct. year yeah. period. But there are lots of companies here that are looking at innovative ways of delivering anesthetic drugs and also about monitoring their effects and possibly most importantly about the sustainability of that. Yeah, these are also three of the topics that we cover here at Your Anesthesia. And perhaps you have seen already in our exhibition hall, we have the Innovation Village. Yeah. That's an cool. experiment from Isaac this year where we cover on three topics, sustainability, as you said, connectivity and the Brain Initiative. The Brain Initiative started two years ago, just post-COVID, with everything that connects to the brain, mm-hmm. going from EG to drugs to protection, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. We added sustainability last year in Glasgow because if you ask me about hot topics, this is certainly a hot topic, not only for the clinicians, but also for our industrial partners. That sustainability, tomorrow, for example, we will sign with our partners, the Glasgow Declaration. I'm pretty sure that some of my colleagues... We'll talk about it, yeah. You will. So I will not go into details here. Uh, But sustainability is one of the topics here uh, also at the Innovation Village. and, And we connect clinicians, academic experts with experts from the industry in a relaxed atmosphere, a small room, uh, open open skies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's lovely to do. Yeah. So these are these are the initiatives we take as a Zaik to uh, to come up with some new initiatives. But to answer your question on the pharma industry, well we have some pharma companies yeah. coming back, luckily, because we need new drugs also in our yeah. field of perioperative medicine and intensive care. And luckily, there are some new molecules coming out, uh, like remimazolam, and um, we see some on the opiate side and on the pain medication. We see a lot of innovations. Not all of them reach the market yet, but let's hope they continue because we are in niche markets, but we need new drugs to increase our patient safety even more. We also noticed that you've got a great trainee program here at the meeting. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, the trainees are a very important part of the society, and um, one of the trainees is a is a one of the trainees is a board member. So we want oh, to have great. yeah yeah we want to have, have our trainees represented even at the leadership level of Isaac, and they are very active. They are and they give us a lot of input in the scientific committee, for bringing up topics that are very important for them. For example, also on sustainability, but also on some basic stuff they want to know about, yeah, the profession of anesthesia that perhaps we as more well, I learned a new word, seasoned uh, anesthesiologist. <laughs> I'm not sure I like that one. I'm so well seasoned or black. I don't like I don't want to be called senior anesthesiologist. <laughs> so one of my colleagues called it seasoned. seasoned. I don't know what to think about it. Anyway, experience. Experience is perhaps also better. But the residents are, of course, interested in also learning some basic stuff. So this is, and we have a fantastic exchange program. Yeah. So they can travel through Europe, learn from modern centers that they can visit. So it's great. I'm speaking on a panel actually shortly about mobility in anesthesia yeah. training. It's all about, you know, the risks and benefits of taking time out before, during or after training to travel and uh, what you can gain from experiencing other health systems. I'm looking forward to it. I might get put, you know, <laughs> under the the microscope. <laughs> there you go. That'll be fun. As an experience, as a seasoned <laughs> anesthesiologist, what is your perspective on this <laughs> Travel uh, to work is fantastic, don't you think, Michelle? Yeah. So in the background, apart from being the chair of, of everything, you're also... Uh, <laughs> it's enough with the scientific quality. Yeah. So as well as being the chair of the scientific committee of the ISEAC and, and the chair of your department, you're also an active clinical researcher and Correct. clinical pharmacologist. Yeah. And in fact, work that you've done is about to be implemented or is implemented in loads of TCI pumps worldwide. Can you give us a bit of a background and then an update on that? Oh, sure. It's one of my passions to talk mm-hmm. about 
That's your baseline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Target role diffusion has been a large part of my career. And we have a fantastic team in Groningen. It's multidisciplinary, consisting of anesthesiologists, but also pharmacists, uh, pharmacometricians, uh, engineers, and data scientists. And over the last 15 years, we developed the next generation of pharmacokinetic dynamic models for drugs like propofol, remifentanil, dexmethadomidine. And now these models are incorporated in the most recent generation of target controlled infusion pumps. So we have the Elevelt model for propofol, the Elevelt model for remifentanil, and the Honeyford Colin model for dexmethadomidine, offering benefits for patients compared to the older models. The big benefit of the new models is that we were capable of having much more data. So, and that's thanks to the scientific community of all our partners and friends worldwide. For example, for Propofol, we got more than 1,000 patients in the database from, Mm -hmm. I think, more than 25 studies from all over the world. Colleagues donated their data, of course, anonymized and following all the rules, and that is the database that we use for this study with more than 10,000 data points on blood samples, for example. So for the benefit of our listeners, a lot of the pharmacokinetic models that we've been using for decades in TCI pumps are based on very small groups of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Less than 100 people or in the GEPS model, a couple of dozen people. Yes. And, those... and all medical students who, with, with the same height and weight. So, <laughs> so you can't represent... The... Yes. <laughs> Nevertheless, this model is quite practical and works yeah. quite well. But of course, you don't cover the extremes of your population, yeah. like children and elderly obese patients. And with these new models, we try to incorporate also data from these patients so that we can use this model in a more universal way, not having to switch between models when you have a patient in a, what we call a more extreme group. And that's beneficial. So what data do you need to input into the pump to activate the uh, Elevelt model? We, in other models, we put in the age, gender or sex and BMI of the patient. What's required for the new model? Well, the entry parameters uh, are the same as what we have in the Schneider model and the older models. So yeah. that's gender indeed, weight, age and length. And for the Elevelt model, we found that there is an influence of opiates being co-administered with propofol on a surgical level, not if you do sedation on lower, but if you have a significant surgical concentration of an opiate, it changes the pharmacokinetics of propofol a little bit. So the fifth parameter is just a yes-no. Are you co-administering opiates with propofol? Then you check the box. But otherwise, the parameters are the same. Yeah, that was our goal, not to make things too complex. And of course, you can enter a lot of parameters in that model that people have to, yeah. to put in. But well, I need to ask a question. Sure. So I practice anesthesia in the U.S., yeah. and we don't have TCI pumps there. So can you tell us just a little bit about, you know, the different models and what you're explaining? Because it's not translating very well to what we do. I know. No, well. It's a shame. With all respect for the U.S., and I have a lot of friends and colleagues in the U.S. But That's not my decision. No, it's fine. <laughs> the FDA never approved TCI in yeah. the U.S., and yeah. we have it everywhere. Yeah, except in the U.S. Except in the U.S., it is. Yeah. Yeah. So we hope that one day things are changing. If yeah. I uh, understand my U.S. colleagues, FDA is is willing to think about it yeah. uh, because yeah, everybody is, is using it worldwide and we have so much evidence that it's as safe as Steva in, yeah. in milliliters per hour administration. And there is no additional risk to use TCI, but it offers you a lot of benefits and that you control the time component of your drug administration, what you don't do when you give milliliters per hour. So the FDA is probably willing to look at it, but the company has to approach the FDA. The FDA is not, they are saying yes or no, approve or not approve. So I think we should, or or our US colleagues should ask the industry to invest in that kind of technology and move forward to the FDA. Well, I mean, we're doing so much TIVA now. There's just been a major push for doing total IV anesthesia. Sustainability. Exactly. Yeah. And for the types of cases that we're doing to reduce anesthetic gas, whenever we're doing, you know, I mean, I work in a major spine institute, so I don't know the exact percentage, but it's very high of TIVA cases. And I'm also a quality person. I'm vice president of clinical quality for a large national company. And when I think about the safety that it has for patients, you know, the, the value of that. Such, 
So go for it. I know. Okay, here's the push. Here's the ask. Right. Here now. is the very good uh, point, Isaria, because the game changer is sustainability. Yeah. I think more and more we see it also here at Euro Anesthesia. Yes. Also, our colleagues, our industry colleagues, clinicians are becoming more and more interested in the aspects of sustainability, and of course. Avoiding acetyl fluorine does certainly does fluorine and nitrous oxide is one thing. Yeah. yeah, we talk a lot about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michelle, we just want to congratulate you again. This is absolutely fantastic. You've done a wonderful job. You and Thank the team. You. <laughs> uh, but me and the team and the staff of his Ike in Brussels. Yes, they've been great. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As we wrap here, any other sessions or any other speakers or any other topic that you know, as our listeners are going to find more content, what are some of the things we should be looking at? Oh, it, don't ask me to to <laughs> name one because that would be very subjective. So I'll not do that. I think there is such an yeah, possibility way. to and and uh, in our apps it's an amazing app you can it, it, we we tagged all the um, all the sessions with multiple emojis so oh. that you can yeah there are thirty different tags so if you go to a tag and say I want to learn everything about cardiac or about uh, the EG or about uh, pediatrics or local regional or ambulatory then you go to the app you you tag ambulatory for example and then you will get a list of all the possibilities on uh, you can. And, and there's a virtual component to this media, doesn't there? Yes, we are hybrids. Yeah. Not fully hybrids, right. um, and that uh, is for cost reasons because it's very, very expensive to to, to, to duplicate this on-site event totally uh, virtually. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, a lot of a lot of sessions are live yeah. and can be followed. We have at this moment we have around one thousand people online. No, nice. really? Yep. Golly, twenty percent of the mm -hmm. uh, education going these. global. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You have people from everywhere uh, on the planet. You see Asia, Australia. Uh, people who are too far to travel or with restricted budgets. So we are also happy to uh, to have like reduced fees for the low income countries to follow us online. Um, so yeah, we try to uh, to do that. Wonderful. And I know everyone can find more information if they want to look at the content and, and even perhaps yeah. find some of the content. And become a member here. of ISAIC. That's, uh, that's not that costly. And in return, you got a lot of benefits. Uh, you can go to our very extensive e-learning platform. And I know that you will interview one of my uh, colleagues from the Education Committee, Joanna, about that. So um, Coming she, up. She, yeah, she will <laughs> tell you everything about uh, our virtual learning space. Fantastic. And it's esaic.org yes. is uh, the website and yep. everything that you should want to find out about your wonderful organization and the, the wonderful meeting that you've done. You can find us there. Yeah. All right. Michelle, thank you so much. Thank you, Boats. What thank a wonderful you. chat. Thank you. All right. And thank you for listening to Top Med Talk. You know, you can always find us at topmedtalk.com. More conversations just like this from SCIAC, you can uh, find there and on your favorite podcatcher. And we're on social, X, LinkedIn, Facebook. We are there. And YouTube, too. If you have found this on YouTube, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you so much to the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care for supporting Top Med Talk this year. Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe. Check us out on YouTube. And, of course, on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and X. Also, it's important to remember that Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that, and the way to do that is epom.org. Check out our website and find out about some of the incredible conferences we're going to be arranging across the year. epom.org.